Hello and welcome. My name is William Wexler and I lead the Atlantic Council's work on the Middle East. Um, thank you very much for joining us today for what I hope will be a very interesting discussion uh, based on a, an important uh, report that we are issuing today. The subject is counterterrorism, but a specific uh, element of the US counterterrorism toolkit. Um, it's been about 20 years, just under 19 years since um, the attacks of 9-11. And while the threat of, uh, of counter of terrorist attacks continues and has evolved and has uh, shifted in different parts of the world, the tool sets that the United States used have, um, have remained in the same categories, um, military tools, uh, intelligence and covert operation tools, and uh, other civilian tools such as law enforcement or sanctions. The, um, the reality is, however, is that there's been an awful lot written since 9-11 about our military approach to combating terrorism. Um, there has also been a lot written on our covert operations and intelligence that we do. There is, there is less written on the uh, law enforcement to law enforcement ties that are um, critical to, uh, to dealing with this problem all around the world. And, it, it's, and make no mistake, it's not just critical, but at the end of the day, the definition of success in our counterterrorism efforts um, is changing our approach from being able to change from a military and intelligence driven approach to a law enforcement approach. Um, if you can again, go back 19 years when we looked at our partners in the Gulf, um, where a lot of Osama bin Laden's um, money was drawn from, where much of his uh, ideology was at the time, um, uh, uh, fell on um, receptive ears. There was relatively limited cooperation through those channels. Um, that is not the case today. Um, that has, uh, things have evolved tremendously through a lot of work across multiple administrations. And you know, one of the things that Americans tend to have the hardest time recognizing is slow incremental progress over time. And this is one of those instances where we have had that kind of slow incremental progress over time. There is of course um, a lot further that we need to go uh, in the United States um, in our, with our partners in the Gulf, um, but, uh, but it's also important to recognize how far we have come along those lines. Um, uh, to that end, uh, we commissioned a report by our non-resident fellow, Tom Warwick, and our program assistant, um, uh, 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 assisted by Josie um, uh, Palaio, um, to, uh, to look deeply at this question and look at what we have accomplished, um, what we still need to accomplish, and give recommendations to governments, um, both here and abroad, on what needs to be done. We're going to have a a thorough discussion of their of their results led by uh, Tom Moore. But before I turn it over to him, let me uh, uh, let me just uh, mention that this is, of course, a public event. It's an on the record event. The recording will be shared later on social media and on our website. Um, the report's name is Improving Counterterrorism and Law Enforcement Cooperation Between the U.S. and the Arab Gulf States. Um, a link um, to the full report will be put in the chat box. Um, and we also are going to put in the chat box uh, an interactive table that we've put together um, that, talk, that shows the um, alignment of security services uh, between the United States and the countries of, of the Arab um, Gulf states. Those, um, those security services uh, uh, have different roles depending on different government systems, um, and, uh, uh, but it's critically important to understand where the alignments are and where there are disalignments um, as well. And that, that tool we put in the, um, in the chat. Please don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the report's website. Uh, follow us on Twitter at, um, at AC Mideast and use the hashtag, um, hashtag AC Mideast um, to ask any questions, or you can also use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And now I wanna hand it over to, uh, to Tom Warwick, our lead author, um, who, uh, uh, who before he joined us as a non-resident fellow, um, was for about a dozen years at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, where he led the counterterrorism work. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary there. Um, and I know of no one better uh, to talk about this subject. Uh, Tom, over to you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Will. Um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to give a very short summary of some of the highlights of our report. Uh, I really do recommend uh, it, obviously, to, to uh, everyone. Uh, it's uh, full of a wealth of details of, of uh, history, how we got to our current situation, uh, and very detailed recommendations uh, for uh, the United States, for our Arab Gulf state partners, uh, uh, for the U.S. Congress. Uh, uh, and for others. Um, uh, I'll then be introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, for Homeland Security for International Affairs, Valerie Boyd. Uh, we'll then have some discussion with some of the members of the task force that the Atlantic Council convened on um, Middle East counterterrorism and law enforcement cooperation uh, uh, by uh, civilian security uh, organizations. Uh, and then my colleague Kirsten Fontenrose will lead a panel of uh, uh, international experts. Uh, uh, we have the head of international cooperation from the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Interior, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Dana uh, Humaid al Marzuki, uh, and uh, uh, one of the leading scholars uh, in this field, Dr. Abdullah bin Khalid al Saud from Saudi Arabia. Um, so let me uh, first uh, give you some of the highlights of the report that we released. Um, as Will said, the discussion in Washington about the U.S. security relationship with the Middle East uh, has been dominated recently by the discussion of whether uh, the U.S. military presence in the Middle East uh, uh, needs to be reduced. This is something on which President Trump and many Democratic leaders have spoken uh, about in the last few years. But the choice is often offered between military presence or withdrawal or between military power and diplomacy. There are other options uh, and other things in the national security toolkit, not just for the United States, but for other countries that actually deserve more attention. This includes cooperation in areas such as aviation security, uh, especially given the importance of the Middle East as a gateway between uh, uh, South Asia uh, and Europe and North America. Uh, land border security, maritime security, law enforcement, uh, countering terrorists' abilities to use money. These are all important tools in the toolkit. And one of the things that we noticed as we were taking a look at this uh, is that cooperation between our respective militaries and our respective intelligence services is actually very mature and very well developed. But in contrast, the cooperation between civilian uh, agencies is less well developed. There are actually some reasons for that. It's not due to a fault on either side. Uh, in many cases, security organizations, whether in the United States or in the region, uh, are focused on internal security challenges and don't necessarily think of external cooperation uh, un until an event like 9-11 comes along and drives home uh, the need for uh, uh, significantly increased cooperation. Uh, let me just focus for a moment on the current state of the terrorism threat, because one of the things that most experts agree on is the idea that uh, with the uh, end of ISIS's territorial control with the efforts uh, uh, culminating in the raid uh, uh, in Abbottabad, Pakistan that killed Osama bin Laden, um, we are at a state where uh, uh, there seems to be a bit of a lull in the terrorist threat, but it's equally true <clears throat> counterterrorism experts uh, are reminding us uh, that ISIS is working diligently to stage a comeback. Uh, the scholarly work of Michael Knights and others has documented that ISIS is already now at the level of activity that they were in 2012, a little over two years before they uh, uh, return, took power in Mosul in June of 2014 and emerged onto the world stage. So that we know that ISIS is trying to stage a comeback. There was an article in a number of uh, media outlets uh, in the last couple of days about uh, ISIS taking over a town in Mozambique in August. And in fact, terrorist groups have been working to try to establish or control terrorist safe havens in a number of uh, countries in Africa uh, and uh, recently in 
Southeast Asia. In addition, we have other situations uh, uh, that show the possibility of a resurgence in terrorist activity. Um, in Yemen, everyone hopes that the civil war and the human suffering that is going on there will be brought to an end. But the end of the civil war in Yemen, paradoxically, uh, will increase the, the security risk when terrorists are able to travel uh, in and out. And finally, there has to be mention made of the threat of terrorism uh, uh, and asymmetric conflict emanating from Iran, which the United States considers to be the leading state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, uh, we've had a recent paper by Atlantic Council experts uh, Emerson Brookings and Suzanne Kianpour about Iranian influence efforts uh, in the United States. One of the things that we learned in our field work in the region is that in fact Iran is carrying out influence efforts in the Middle East. And just as it's a goal of Russia to try to divide uh, American society, uh, as was revealed uh, by uh, numerous investigations into their activity in the 2016 election and has been disclosed by uh, the uh, Office of the uh, Director for National Intelligence here. They're continuing to do this today. Uh, that's what Russia's goal is. Um, Iran's goal in the United States is to try to sell Iran's position uh, uh, that would try to deter the United States uh, from being involved in the Middle East. But Iran's influence operations in the Middle East are actually closer to Russia's operations against the United States than to Iran's operations against the United States. Uh, so that creates a, a, a very particular kind of threat and security challenge that's going to need to be addressed. Um, we have a number of recommendations as to what should be done uh, by the United States and by the countries in the region to try to address this threat. One of the first and in, in ways easiest, but also one of the most difficult, is that the countries do need to commit publicly to closer cooperation uh, in the security sphere. There are advantages to each to doing this. A lot of cooperation has gone on, as Will has said, um, but there's been a reluctance for different reasons uh, for the countries to commit to this. The value of public commitment it would be to show uh, uh, adversaries, whether they be terrorist groups or others, uh, that there will be a cooperative relationship driven by the need for, for uh, everyone involved uh, to ensure that terrorist groups uh, no longer uh, uh, are the threat that they have been over the last few years. Second, uh, we really believe it's time for a conversation about the in-state for uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda style of terrorism. Uh, National Counterterrorism Center Director Chris Miller recently wrote about uh, uh, the prospect of this uh, in a way that I think summarized it for a lot of us. Uh, uh, this is going to be one of those things for which, as long has been said, there will be no military parade of victory. Um, but the goal should be that terrorism is a problem that can be dealt with by local law enforcement in countries around the world without the need for large-scale military deployments, as was required uh, to deal with al-Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan or ISIS uh, in uh, Iraq or Syria. This is going to take real planning because the international scale and scope of the terrorist uh, threat uh, is going to require planning that we say needs to be thought of as the scale of planning that it took to end World War II. Uh, uh, the nature of the campaign is going to be uh, complex. Uh, it's going to involve a number of countries making changes to policies and laws. Uh, for example, the thousands of ISIS fighters who are now in detention uh, in, uh, in northeastern Syria uh, and what should be done about their families and especially their children so that they do not uh, follow in the footsteps of, of others in their, in their families who have joined terrorist movements. All of these things require uh, an international planning effort that needs to be undertaken. Uh, second, there, uh, our, next there needs to be a focus on ending terrorist safe havens, on the idea of preventing terrorists from being able to move 
people, money, and materiel across international boundaries. This is not something that military forces are going to be sufficient to deal with, nor is diplomacy by itself going to be sufficient. It's going to take an effort to include a civilian security track, uh, what in DHS's circles is called the Justice Interior and Home Affairs uh, Group. There are numerous discussions like this that go on between the United States and its European partners, and there are bilateral efforts but anytime there are multilateral efforts, like there was with the global coalition to defeat ISIS, uh, uh, then it, it needs to be uh, uh, considered that there has to be a justice interior and home affairs uh, uh, counterpart group to be able to deal with this. Next, we recommend that while there are some countries like the United Na uh, Arab Emirates uh, that are enormously sophisticated and able to engage uh, internationally whenever they wish technology uh, or assistance. Nevertheless, there are some other models that actually would be very useful for countries to think about. We were particularly impressed by the U.S.-Saudi Office of Program Management Ministry of Interior, known by the acronym OPMMOI, which is a means that ensures that the Saudi and U.S. governments can reach a policy agreement on technical assistance or technology procurement. Uh, and then the U.S. government, with reimbursement from, in this case, the Saudi partner, uh, is able to help facilitate transactions in ways that achieve the security and policy objectives of both countries. This is a model that we believe would be useful for other countries to consider. Uh, and while it took some effort on the part of the United States uh, and Saudi Arabia to negotiate the first of these agreements, um, according to everyone we've spoken to on both the Saudi and U.S. sides, there are real advantages that make it a model for others to consider. One thing that's important, which we'll discuss uh, with some of our American experts, is the important, importance of the United States uh, to increase the capacity at overseas embassies, uh, not just in the region, but in other countries where terrorism is a threat. Many of our embassies were built in, in an era uh, uh, where there was an increased need of security but not as much attention uh, to the, the close and tight office space that exists in a number of those countries. United Nations Council Security, uh, I'm sorry, United Nations Security Council Resolution uh, 2396 uh, uh, is another important basis on which to uh, uh, build security because of its provision for countries to collect and use airline passenger information, biometrics and watch lists. And finally, we recommend that many of the methods <clears throat> that can be used to disrupt terrorist plots are equally effective to prevent malign Iranian activity to destabilize the region. Uh, so those are the, the uh, essential highlights of our report. Uh, let me now, if I may, uh, uh, turn to uh, DHS Assistant Secretary uh, Valerie Boyd. Um, DHS, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Assistant Secretary Boyd has a long career uh, in national and homeland security. She was, in fact, part of the team that helped stand up DHS in 2003 and one of, was one of its first spokespeople in the 2003 to 2005 era. She has experience serving in the National Security Council staff from 2008 uh, to 2016. Then she was the Deputy Chief of Staff uh, for policy at DHS's Customs and Border Protection, and then Deputy Chief of Staff to DHS Acting Secretary Kevin McAleenan. She became Assistant Secretary for International Affairs in the DHS Office of Policy in October 2019. When not in public service, she's worked in corporate social responsibility, is from Los Angeles, has her bachelor's degree from the University of California, and a master's in public policy from Harvard University. Um, if I can call on Valerie uh, to give us some remarks with her perspectives on uh, the, the issue of uh, counterterrorism and law enforcement cooperation. So Valerie, over to you. Tom, it's good to see you and thank you for the kind introduction. I'm pleased to see the Atlantic Council focus on civilian security cooperation with the countries of the Arab Gulf, and I'm honored to be invited among the distinguished panel today. I'll kick us off by outlining the Department of Homeland Security's interests in increased cooperation with the Arab Gulf on counterterrorism and related law enforcement efforts, and then I'll be interested to hear the thoughts from the panel. I can vouch that since its inception, DHS has valued the importance of international partnerships. 
DHS has always looked to identify and stop threats to America before those threats reach our shores. This is due in part to our unique and diverse mandate that covers issues ranging from immigration enforcement to cybersecurity, from cargo inspection to maritime security, and from aviation security to critical infrastructure protection. Tackling these issues requires the ability to identify where our mutual objectives of safety and security align and foster resilient partnerships to achieve those objectives. As your report outlines, the Middle East is a region where we place great value and make a large investment to foster strategic foreign partnerships. This region is home to many critical US foreign policy and national security interests and objectives. These include a wide range of issues, including counterterrorism, nonproliferation, energy security, and regional integration into global markets. In particular, we share concerns over a number of threats to our mutual security and interests with the countries of the Arab Gulf. Two main areas of opportunity are counterterrorism and law enforcement cooperation. And I would like to focus on two main threats. First, as you said, Iran continues to exert its malign influence seeking to foster regional instability, both directly and through its use of proxies. And second, ISIS may no longer hold territory in Iraq and Syria. However, the threat posed by it and other foreign terrorist organizations, including Al-Qaeda, persists. This includes threats to aviation security and the threat posed by terrorist use of the internet and radicalization to violence. Improving CT and law enforcement cooperation with the Gulf countries is a key part of DHS's strategy to help address both of these threats. And we've definitely seen some excellent progress and important achievements with several countries of the region. As most of you know, and as summarized in the report, DHS has a wide variety of initiatives and programs designed to safeguard the United States homeland. Many of these have been adapted for our engagement efforts with international partners, where we encourage like-minded countries to adopt similar measures and for us to share information with each other, enhancing implementation of these efforts. These initiatives and programs, which are used broadly but applicable to the Middle East and the Arab Gulf, are designed to prevent terrorist travel, strengthen aviation security capacities to protect international aviation, expand regional border security capacities to prevent the movement of contraband, especially the proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, strengthen cybersecurity capabilities and protect critical infrastructure, expand regional partnerships and information sharing, and expand training and technical assistance efforts. Since 9-11, DHS has raised and continues to raise the global baseline for security to protect both our partners abroad and the homeland. Robust foreign partnerships are critical to our success across the homeland security enterprise. Specifically, DHS provides security cooperation support to our partner countries in the areas of aviation security, border security, law enforcement, cybersecurity, and maritime security. Our components do most of the operational work and work with their foreign counterparts to implement these initiatives. Tom, the report released by the Atlantic Council highlights many of these initiatives, and we appreciate the Atlantic Council's attention while recognizing that priorities for funding programs and activities are constantly evolving and shifting. Allocation of limited resources is always going to be a natural part of the calculus for national security priorities. And we're constantly trying to make good investments with foreign partners by seeking to identify opportunities to strengthen our relationships. We look to work with those countries who share the same security-based objectives to eliminate terrorist movements and their ability to plan and carry out attacks. This is something that will remain a priority. We will do this by building upon our various information sharing efforts, many in accordance with UN Security Council's resolutions such as 2178 from the year 2014, 2396 from the year 2017, and 2482 from just last year. Increased passenger and cargo information sharing is paramount in preventing illicit travel and the movement of contraband in the Arab Gulf and the greater region. One example is our visa waiver program. One of the eligibility requirements contained in the Immigration and Nationality Act is that any country seeking to participate in the VWP enter into, quote, an agreement with the United States to share information regarding whether citizens and nationals of that country traveling to the United States represent a threat to the security or welfare of the United States or its citizens. These kinds of agreements provide for the United States to also share information with the partner country 
And this type of agreement is a great example of the kind of information sharing we would want to see become the norm with our Arab Gulf partners. There are also information sharing programs in other areas, including cargo screening and passenger screening, that we would like to see become routine throughout the region. Another example of this is the automated targeting system Global, known as ATSG, which is a real-time passenger screening program developed by CBP. This program assists partner countries in identifying known and unknown high-risk travelers. This platform is also used by our partners to exchange risk assessments, targeting rule hits, and traveler data. Additionally, the platform has the ability to be connected to Interpol to expand international information sharing efforts. Through this program, our partners meet the international requirements set forth by the multiple UN resolutions that I mentioned that mandate all member states to collect and use airline passenger information and biometrics and to establish watch lists to detect terrorists who may be flying in or out of their territories. This cooperative effort enhances global security while simultaneously facilitating legitimate travel and trade. We look forward to establishing and strengthening passenger information sharing with all Gulf countries to enhance aviation security. Furthermore, DHS intends to pursue similar types of information sharing relationships with the Gulf partners as it pertains to data car cargo data exchange. Under such a relationship, countries transfer their electronic cargo data to CBP's targeting system for risk assessment across the range of customs and border security threats. In turn, CBP officials provide referrals for shipments identified as high risk. The Middle East is the fastest growing market for air travel, or one of the fastest growing mar markets on the globe. And as commercial aviation remains a prime target for terrorists, we will continue to fortify our aviation security partnerships in the Arab Gulf to prevent terrorist travel. On this front, and most notably, DHS opened its first preclearance facility in the Middle East at the Abu Dhabi International Airport in the United Arab Emirates in 2013. Preclearance is part of DHS's layered border strategy that prevents terrorists, criminals, and other national security threats from boarding commercial aircraft bound for the United States. Through preclearance, DHS law enforcement personnel conduct the same immigration, customs, and agriculture inspections of international air travelers typically performed on arrival in the United States before departure from foreign airports. With over 393,000 travelers processed in fiscal year 2019, Abu Dhabi preclearance provides greater security for the aircraft and its passengers as well as more timely information on travelers' flight patterns to enable threats to be intercepted prior to arrival in the United States. As a preclearance facility, the Abu Dhabi International Airport is required to conduct aviation security screening measures commensurate with TSA standards. The Abu Dhabi location has shown what success a Middle Eastern preclearance location can yield. Here's a picture. for what other preclearance facilities in the region can provide in terms of international security. In the new round of preclearance applications, we look forward to engaging with other Gulf countries to expand our cooperation and partnership in this area. Furthermore, DHS interdicts air travelers who are potential threats to the United States, such as foreign fighters and potential terrorists, through additional pre-departure programs called the Immigration Advisory Program, IAP, and the Joint Security Program, JSP, both of which are run by CBP. Both the IAP and JSP allow CBP to deploy its officers to major last point of departure airports, where they work with host country law enforcement and air carrier officials to identify and interdict high-risk travelers so that CBP may recommend air carriers to not permit such travelers to board US-bound flights. DHS has made tens of thousands of no board recommendations to air carriers for air travelers bound for the United States from IAP JSP locations since the program's inception in 2004. CBP officers may also assist air carrier and security employees with document examination and traveler security assessments, provide training to air carrier and host country authority staff analyze electronic passenger information and passenger reservation data to identify potential threats, and engage air carriers and travelers to confirm potential terrorist watch list matches. With 11 locations worldwide, 
IAP and JSP are the exact type of programs that DHS can implement to enhance law enforcement and counterterrorism cooperation with our Arab Gulf partners as we seek to strengthen international aviation security. In short, as mentioned previously, these efforts enhance global security while simultaneously facilitating legitimate travel and trade. Moving to cybersecurity, we will continue to work with our Gulf partners on shared cybersecurity objectives to counter emerging threats to our cyber and critical infrastructure. As this group knows well, the consequences of these digital threats are no less significant than threats in the physical world, and we must ensure that we're addressing these threats just as seriously. As we all know, some of the threats in the physical world originate in the digital one. Groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda now direct, finance, and inspire attacks from their smart smartphones, allowing them to attack to act anytime and anywhere with a network connection. DHS is targeting the avenues of radicalization by working closely with the technology sector to make it far more difficult for terrorists to recruit online. DHS's cybersecurity component, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, continues to develop its relationship with its counterparts in the Arab Gulf as they discuss how to counter emerging digital threats. Through CISA, we're also working with the Computer Emergency Response Teams, CERT, across the Gulf to share technical information to strengthen the overall cyber ecosystem. Within our, miss within our cyber mission space, DHS also focuses on combating cybercrime through our law enforcement agencies, ICE and the US Secret Service. Specifically within the Gulf region, we've been working with our law enforcement partners there to provide dark web and online investigation courses. And we look forward to continuing and expanding upon these relationships. I should focus on maritime security as well and say that the US Coast Guard is part of the DHS family and serves as the department's subject matter experts and facilitators of maritime security operations. Located in Bahrain, Coast Guard's Patrol Forces Southwest Asia, Pet Forswa, is the Coast Guard's largest unit outside of the United States. It was established in 2002 in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and played a key role in maritime security and maritime infrastructure protection operations. The mission of Pet Forswa is to train, organize, equip, support, and deploy combat-ready Coast Guard forces in support of Central Command and national security objectives. The group works with Naval Forces Central Command in furthering their goals to conduct persistent maritime operations to forward U.S. interests and capabilities in order to promote a secure maritime environment. Pet Forswa is currently supporting Operation Enduring Freedom with continued maritime humanitarian presence, providing the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet with combat-ready assets, utilizing our unique access to foreign territorial seas and ports, and formulating strong and independent relationships throughout the Gulf. Finally, DHS will expand capacity building and training efforts with our counterparts to ensure we continue to build upon these strategic bilateral efforts. On this last point, I need to clarify that DHS lacks, with very limited ex exceptions, authority to use our funding to provide capacity building assistance to foreign partners. As such, it is essential that we work closely with relevant U.S. agencies, such as the Department of State, on those funding priorities. And I should also note, as the report does, that uh, DHS is not the only U.S. agency in this space. As the report outlines, the Department of Justice, the Department of Treasury, many others provide important civilian security assistance as well. So in conclusion, the examples I've shared with you today are only a snapshot of the work we do to bolster security abroad and here at home. But they are demonstrations of just how important continuing our lines of effort in the Arab Gulf and the broader Middle East are. The pandemic has slowed some of these efforts, but certainly not stopped them. It is a little more challenging to get an agreement signed by, by both sides when you don't meet face to face, but we're all getting better at virtual meetings and developing the relationships needed to reach new agreements during these challenging times. As important as our bilateral efforts are, information sharing and cooperation should not be limited between individual countries in the United States. We can more fully address threats in the region if we work collectively, including countries of the region working to resolve their differences and work together on these mutual threats. So on that note, I would like to pass the virtual mic back to Tom and to the panel for the question and answer section. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. And I look forward to hearing your questions and discussing these important issues further. 
thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Boyd. We're going to build our uh, uh, virtual panel here uh, in the next few seconds and, and have several people join us. Um, uh, let me just say as a procedural note that we will be taking uh, audience questions through the Q&A feature. Uh, so at the bottom of your Zoom window is a little button that brings up a tiny window uh, called Q&A. Uh, we've already gotten uh, a question there, um, but there's obviously time and room for more. Um, when you use the Q&A feature, please include your name uh, if it's not already displayed and uh, your affiliation. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, and we'll uh, continue this part of the discussion until 1.10 p.m. Uh, so uh, let me take moderator's privilege, uh, uh, Valerie, uh, and, and ask you the following question. Um, the U.S. does have a number of programs uh, intended for uh, countries that need U.S. financial assistance. Um, but the countries of the Arab Gulf are, are all upper middle uh, and upper income uh, countries. And so you don't have the kind of, of uh, financial assistance programs, but nevertheless, uh, how does DHS build up cooperation with uh, security partners that don't need financial assistance, but do want to work more closely with you and, and partner with DHS uh, in security areas? How is that done without uh, uh, financial assistance programs involved? It's, it's a great question, and it's a, a pleasure to work with partners that, that have inherent uh, capabilities and, and resources. And, um, and really, it's all about identifying mutually aligned uh, security objectives. So we all want to prevent the movement of, uh, of ter terrorists and, and dangerous goods through aviation, through cargo, through maritime security, and through information sharing programs such as um, JSP, IAP, ATSG. Sorry for the acronym soup, but, um, but we've talked about all of these a bit already. Um, these are the kinds of um, initiatives where we can both agree to information sharing together, um, deploying personnel to, uh, to assist and advise. Um, essentially, it, it does not always require capacity building. Information sharing is, is uh, one of the most important things that we can do. Uh, and let me bring in uh, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley uh, to talk about the State Department's role uh, in uh, uh, the civilian security uh, area. Um, Ambassador Wynn Stanley, you were uh, the, uh, involved in leading the State Department Counterterrorism Bureau during uh, a number of decisive years. Uh, recently, um, uh, what, what's your thought on on uh, the role that the State Department plays in trying to facilitate cooperation uh, in the civilian security area? Well, easily I can say it's a crucial role, an indispensable one. Um, the State Department often has the funding and does the coordinating among various agencies. Um, I want to commend the report for several things that it teased out, that importance of civilian agencies and not focusing on the military side as a diplomat. I can only commend and encourage that to be happening. Uh, but there are challenges and the coordinating role is particularly one of them. And that gets to some of your other points about funding and support to ensure that it's done as well as possible. So with the State Department coordinating among agencies like Treasury, uh, like DHS, like the FBI and others that are doing great work overseas, making sure that the monies are not overlapping, that people have visibility, agencies have visibility over what each of them are doing so that we get the best possible optimal results from the money that's spent by U.S. taxpayers and the cooperation coming from other nations. So this is absolutely key. Um, I know I mentioned to you earlier that part of that coordinating role is that chief of mission uh, uh, role and making sure that people at embassies are doing what legislatively and regulatorily they're supposed to be doing most effective and it can be a challenge. So I do want to put that out there as well. When you talk about sending increasing numbers of agencies abroad, you're, you're going to get some pause and the need to work through the details of how that is effectively done. 
Um, and uh, uh, in terms, uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Boyd, of the way DHS uh, works with state on this, um, uh, what kinds of, of support do you need uh, from the State Department to be able to carry out the programs that you were just describing? So we have very close relationships with the Department of State, uh, INL, CT bureaus, where we work closely together. Um, apologies, that's going to take a minute to turn off. Um, but we work together on strategic budgeting on a multi-year project, um, ensuring that we have uh, program managers in place. Apologies, I'll go turn that off. All right, well, it takes her a second to go back. Um, uh, Javed, let me bring you into this as well, because uh, you've had a unique perspective uh, having worked at the NSC on, on counterterrorism issues uh, across the board. I'm wondering if you can give us uh, your sense of the sweep of uh, counterterrorism cooperation, uh, especially as we look to the successes that were achieved on your watch uh, in terms of defeating ISIS. Uh, uh, and, and now as we move to a, a different phase, what is your sense of the way uh, uh, this kind of security cooperation is evolving in the region? Well, Tom, thanks for that introduction. And you are far too kind in giving me personally any credit for um, sort of the work, the strong work that the team did when I was uh, at the NSC. So it was very much a team effort. Um, and great to, to be joining you and, and Will and Jose um, on this project as well. So as you mentioned, uh, I was on the Trump administration National Security Council for the first year of the administration from 2017 to 2018. And we definitely tried to tackle a number of important counterterrorism priorities. Um, leading the effort against, uh, leading, trying to lead the policy effort um, against the ISIS threat was certainly uh, high on the top of the list, if not the top um, priority. But in the years since, uh, as this report has called out, even though you know, a tremendous amount of effort through a global coalition was applied to put pressure on ISIS in Iraq and Syria, defeat the physical caliphate, the threat still remains. And there are other aspects of this threat that still probably aren't yet addressed that may give new life to ISIS, even though, again, the, the group or the organization looks very different now than it did even um, three, four years ago uh, during the beginning of the Trump administration. One of those issues that I think needs a tremendous amount of attention and this uh, sort of group that you've convened together looking at the um, civilian counterterrorism and law enforcement domains, this is probably a, a space or a sphere that can, can do a lot of work um, against this issue I'm gonna raise is the, the number of um, ISIS detainees to include fighters, um, both from the region and foreign fighters, probably more broadly family members to include women and children who are now being held or continue to be held in these large sprawling um, camps, mostly in Syria. The biggest one uh, for folks who know is one called uh, the al Hol camp in um, Northern Syria. And there are literally tens of thousands of, of family members uh, and a, a, a lower number of, of fighters sprinkled in there. So this seems to be in the um, not moving in the right direction category. This is a, right now it's a latent threat, but it has potential to become an active operational one. If we do not come up with a international game plan to manage either the repatriation, repatriation, de-radicalization, um, prosecution of, of this large pool of individuals who are now confined in these camps. And this seems to be um, an issue that we need a lot more leadership and policy attention on. And this group seems to be the right one to tackle it. Um, and Valerie, uh, Javid has raised an enormously uh, important and interesting point. And I know this has to concern you and your colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security a great deal, given your, your expertise and your need to track terrorist travel and, and to try to prevent uh, uh, any of these uh, ISIS fighters from ever coming into the United States. What can you tell us about the Trump administration's progress in terms of trying to deal with this population of, of fighters and their family members uh, in northeastern Syria? What is the, the state of our, our efforts uh, uh, as a government to try to address the, uh, the problems of, uh, of these ISIS fighters? I'm sorry, you're still on mute. There we go. 
Thank you. It's certainly a significant and ongoing area of effort where um, first we need the ability to understand who the individuals are, then we need their information in systems that we can access. And uh, that, uh, that sort of chain of custody allows us to identify and work with partners to prevent their boarding aircraft. Um, I do, I can say in general that our, our partnerships are um, are, are broadening, increasing with every year. Um, as I've mentioned, there are uh, uh, multiple uh, lines of effort and, um, and, and some limited areas of resources where we uh, do have to uh, do have to ensure that um, we're continually focusing um, on, on both partner capacity building and um, and our own internal capacity building to ensure that that, that full chain of, of, uh, of custody continues. I'm also interested to hear the thoughts of the panel and their reactions on, on uh, how they believe progress is going. Um, uh, Javed, what is your sense of that right now? Oh, you're still muted. With respect to the the issue that I raised, Tom, or, or the broader one that Assistant Sec Secretary Boyd. Uh, well, I, I think I think to her point about uh, uh, the state of of what uh, not just the United States but other countries are doing with uh, the population that still exists in jails in in northern Syria. Yeah, it seems to be uneven. I think some countries have taken uh, sort of a unilateral approach and made it a priority. Um, the United States also has has stepped up in in um, recent months and and even from the, the smaller pool of Americans who were either at a whole or other um, facilities, they've now been repatriated to the United States. Um, but I do think there's still sort of a void of sort of an overall organized, cohesive, strong, um, kind of centrally focused effort on this as opposed to the more kind of ad hoc approach right now. And again, there's, it's only going to take one or two of these individuals who kind of slips, if, if they were unfortunately to slip through the net um, with respect to either repatriation or going back into their home countries and, and perhaps not um, sort of being monitored at the right level. And then if one of these individuals is successful in conducting an attack overseas or, or in the region, there's gonna be a lot of questions raised about why didn't we do more to prevent this from, from happening? So I think this is an area where we can just spend a lot more time and attention to get ahead of a threat that we can see like literally sitting in front of the international community. Um, but we just need, I think there's a lot more work that we can we can do collectively. Um, Kirsten Fontenrose, let me bring you in at this because in your, in your perspectives uh, uh, at the National Security Council and then previously at the State Department uh, and at DOD, you've seen uh, the kinds of interagency cooperation that it takes to try to put something like this together. Uh, uh, and in terms of how we, we work out these relationships uh, for the future, what is your thought on, on uh, how this kind of, of issue can be best addressed? I think the biggest, the biggest obstacle we always see, and I'm going to speak a little truth here, is in the bureaucracies in the region um, themselves, and of course within our own bureaucracy. It's, it's finding what the exact counterpart organizations are and then getting approval at the top levels in each of the countries for any one of its organizations to take part in any kind of you know, um, larger than just a bilateral discussion. We constantly see from, from a lot of the regional states requests for much more co cooperation with the U.S. directly, but not so much in terms of a, um, in terms of a hub and spoke model or in terms of regional models. And as the U.S. government, what we're always pushing for is more inter-regional cooperation as well, not just bilaterally with us. We'd like to see the region become more self-sufficient in many of these ways and talk to themselves quite a bit more. And I think for us, that's that's the, the, the biggest obstacle has been convincing the region that there's a lot to be gained by them working together more closely as well as with us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and so uh, let me also bring in Danny Glazer, uh, because in the terrorist finance area, uh, this is one of those things, uh, Danny, that you worked on uh, very closely with a number of states on a bilateral basis, but then also you led uh, the terrorist finance group of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Uh, and so you're in a unique position to talk about this, uh, the, the bilateral versus multilateral uh, uh, issue. Um, uh, what is your thought on, on what Kirsten is saying about ways that the United States might be able to try to encourage uh, this kind of, of cooperation. 
And then Gina, I'll come back to you for uh, after Danny speaks on this. Thanks, thanks, Tom. And you know, terrorist financing is a is a in some ways unique and and, and a really interesting um, sub sub area of, of the overall fight against against terrorism. And and the reason I think is is because it's it's by definition so multidisciplinary. So there's a supervisory and regulatory aspect uh, to the fight against terrorist financing. There's a law enforcement aspect to it. There's an intelligence aspect to it. There's a, um, a diplomatic aspect to it. And then there's also a strong role that the private sector plays um, plays in it. So uh, in, in in a lot of ways, it it it's it's hard to slip it into pre-existing uh, areas of cooperation. It's it's always sort of creating its own its own track. And there, there actually is, you know, there are there are very well developed um, uh, organizations and mechanisms that facilitate cooperation on counterterrorist financing uh, worldwide, regionally, and and of course, of course, bilaterally. You mentioned you mentioned one, the uh, the, the 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 global camp, the the global coalition against ISIS had a specific and has a specific counterterrorist financing. A track to it. There's the Financial Action Task Force, which is organized globally. The the, the MENA FATF, the Middle East North Africa Financial Action Task Force, um, uh, operates uh, within the region, and then within the Gulf in particular, which is in, in a lot of ways one of the most advanced um, regions uh, in the world in the fight against terrorist financing. Um, there's a considerable amount of uh, cooperation through the GCC itself and through um, other um, entities which have been stood up, the Terrorist Financing Tracking Center and other um, entities, which interestingly, um, in certain ways, um, uh, uh, span the, the, full, the full membership of the, uh, of the GCC and actually allow the countries in some ways to overcome some of the um, internal uh, political, uh, uh, political divides that they've been facing for the past uh, two or three years. Um, uh, I think the role that the U.S. plays in that, in all of this, um, directly with the Gulf countries, um, is one of helping helping these countries uh, uh, with issues relating to effectiveness. Um, all these countries at this point have the laws on the books. They have institutions in place, um, and they have a, a, a political commitment uh, to, to, to to execute on these um, on these commitments. Uh, what we what we haven't seen in in the, in the Gulf, and frankly, what, it's not unique to the Gulf. What we haven't seen worldwide um, is the ability to be able to show um, at times um, uh, real, uh, uh, tangible um, uh, examples of effectiveness. How um, these measures are really uh, um, are really um, impacting um, um, the overall effort, um, and I think that that's um, that's where uh, I think strong cooperation with the United States in order to identify. Um, where the where the systems aren't working as well as they could be, and where and and what we can do together, um, you know, sort of bilaterally and also regionally, um, to enhance that effectiveness, to enhance that implementation, um, is is where I, I see uh, I see the future going in our cooperation with the Gulf on these issues. Ambassador Win Stanley, um, you you worked obviously very extensively on on these kinds of issues. Um, what is your perspective in terms of, of the, the value and importance of trying to develop multilateral uh, cooperation uh, on counterterrorism in this part of the world? And, and I'm speaking particularly not just about the terror finance issue that Danny mentioned, but some of the other uh, issues we've been discussing here that don't get quite as much attention as the military track uh, does. What is your thought on, on the, the ability to try to, to get more multilateral cooperation in this area? And then Assistant Secretary Voigt, I'll, I'll come to you with the same question. Yeah, um, I think every panelist, uh, we all agree that it would be an incredible boon for effectiveness if we could increase cooperation multilaterally, regionally, as well as bilaterally on these issues via civilian organizations. The military cannot do everything, uh, or at least everything effectively. One of the things that I think I would like to recommend to those who are reading the report is that you've got a great, great section referring to 5i cooperation and other fora for multilateral, the GCTF, for instance. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is that three of the seven Gulf countries are part of the GCTF, not all of them. Um, what are the challenges that we've seen 
with our 5i cooperation, as well as the benefits and how do we extrapolate and expand those and convince others to engage in that level of cooperation. And I say convince others and also convince ourselves because one of those challenges, all of us who worked for the US government recognizes that we're looking for cooperation, we're looking for information sharing, and we have our own challenges, as Kirsten mentioned, in our own bureaucracy of also sharing, of also you know, leaning forward in that cooperation. So we all face those challenges, but we've got lots of examples of the effectiveness of it. And I, I would like to explore a little further as to what are those challenges and uh, lessons to be learned as we try and push forward on that kind of cooperation with regard to the Gulf. I think it would be highly beneficial. And Assistant Secretary Boyd, I mean, I know that DHS uh, uh, does a number of these sort of things in in multi layers, and that you have a uh, a bilateral layer in which you discuss th these issues directly with uh, uh, most, if not all, of the countries we've been discussing today. And then at the same time, there are the efforts uh, like at ICAO that uh, TSA and CBP have very much uh, been involved in. But uh, in terms of trying to put together uh, the kind of effort uh, such as what uh, Danny did on terrorist finance. Uh, uh, I'm really asking about, you know, something that is is uh, hard to predict, which is what's the next crisis going to look like uh, and how are you going to approach a, a crisis that hasn't even occurred yet. But uh, in terms of, of DHS's thinking on the bilateral and multilateral aspect of this, uh, what's your thought on on uh, what uh, uh, ought to be done the next time we face uh, a crisis on the scale of of an ISIS or Al Qaeda that that really does pose a a, a regional, if not global, threat? It's it's a terrific question that really demonstrates the 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 proof of the premise that these are not bilateral initiatives that that we really have to work together, resolve differences regionally, and and come up with with broad regional approaches. Um, I know we've we've worked to propose the Middle Eastern Strategic Alliance (MESA), um, which is a comprehensive partnership across economic uh, security and 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 other um, uh, other dimensions. Uh, progress continues to be made. And, uh, and we do have important bilateral conversations that, that contribute towards the larger whole, including supporting the State Department's bilateral dialogues with the UAE, Qatar, and, and Kuwait uh, just within the last month, uh, one of which happen is happening today. So, um, so yes, I agree. It is very difficult to predict what the next crisis is going to be and, and how we mobilize together. But I think that that when those crises arrive, we've um, we've shown great willingness and ability to um, to come together to come up with the right framework to address those those uh, those new concerns. And uh, Kristen, I have to turn to you for any discussion of Mesa because you are, are in many ways the inspirational source of a lot of my thinking uh, on the, uh, the importance of this. Uh, so I really do want to make sure your perspective is added to, uh, uh, to what Valerie has just said. Well, thanks, Tom. And frankly, at the NSC, while we were designing Mesa, we had a lot of gratitude for DHS's role in working on several pieces with us. Um, one of which you were spearheading in terms of cooperation on some of the aviation security questions. Also, one of the one of the pillars of Mesa was a CT uh, cooperation framework uh, that was that was looking at increasing coordination between all of the potential Mesa member countries. Um, in the current idea for Mesa, which is not a dead thing, but was pushed back a year by insistence from some of the Gulf nations that it be security only. Um, one of the one of the pillars really was how do we increase interregional cooperation with the US at the table and then pull in additional international partners on these exact issues, on the breadth of security issues that are not necessarily military? Um, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, we're still looking for uh, any, any questions worthwhile. Um, one thing uh, that uh, uh, one of our uh, questioners has asked is the relationship uh, between uh, the overseas security cooperation 
and terrorism threats uh, here at home. Uh, uh, and in particular, the ability of, of terrorist groups uh, in the region to reach into the United States. Uh, the questioner makes a specific reference to, to uh, uh, the investigations that the FBI did, Javed, while you were there about uh, ties between uh, 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 certain people in Minnesota who are using means to try to finance Al-Shabaab activities. Uh, but as well, there, there were uh, other sorts of instances uh, like that. Um, so the, the question really concerns uh, the value of working with overseas partners to try to help our, our uh, terrorism investigations here at home. Javed, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, and then uh, Valerie, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. So Tom, thanks for the question as presented by um, one of the uh, participants. So um, that is a key component of discovery or what I would call sort of discovery about um, terrorism plots and where they originate that are directed against the United States, as, as folks know. Some, some of these plots over the past uh, almost 20 years have, have um, been generated sort of locally here in the United States, but several have started um, first overseas with the ultimate objective being directed back in the United States. And um, on several occasions, the initial clues about those overseas directed plots towards the United States homeland were coming from foreign partners that without those relationships, either on the intelligence side, military, um, other uh, government institutions, the United States probably would not have been as um, sort of cited on, on where those plots were. And luckily we were able to, to disrupt almost all of them. But that to me shows the value of that kind of strong uh, foreign partnership when it comes to counterterrorism information sharing, that it's certainly very helpful from the U.S. perspective to get ahead of plotting that could be directed back here inside the United States. And Assistant Secretary Boyd, the, the, the same point to you. I mean, I, I know this is literally, uh, you know, the day-to-day the -day, uh, existence of you and your office, uh, uh, but I think it is worth uh, highlighting uh, uh, for our, our audience participant, <clears throat> the relationship between the kinds of cooperation that you work on uh, with countries in the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, uh, does this in fact have the direct benefit uh, to the security of the homeland that uh, uh, I think many people want to know about? I, I, Tom, I agree. It's the foundation of everything that we do, that, um, that to the extent that we can identify and disrupt plots overseas, um, and, and prevent the danger from entering the homeland uh, it is, it, it is uh, one of the most critical things that we can do. I, I think the question alludes to, uh, to the efforts um, domestically to, to prevent plots that, uh, that, that take place uh, within the homeland. I, I think that's, that's possibly a, a different conversation than, than the one today. Um, but, but as we've discussed, um, it, almost everything that, that, that my office is doing is attempting to um, create the partnerships where we can identify uh, bad actors, identify when they're moving, understand if they are who they say they are, and prevent their entry or uh, the entry of dangerous goods into the United States. Um, so another question that we have is, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, asked by uh, William Markwick of the Gulf Center for Strategic Studies, um, who asks about the, the challenge posed by the uh, uh, nature, and he describes it of one or two countries, but I think it's more general, uh, that security ministries uh, tend to focus on, on their own internal challenges, local crime, local uh, uh, threats, uh, and the ability of, of uh, Assistant Secretary Boyd offices like yours uh, to get those countries to open up and, and to recognize that there's value in cooperation with the United States uh, in the other direction. In other words, th this is the precise reciprocal of what we were just talking about, the value to the U.S. of international cooperation. Uh, uh, what is your sense about the value of what the United States can bring to uh, the Gulf uh, Arab states and other countries uh, if they would uh, cooperate more closely with the United States? What do they get out of it? 
Well, it's a it's a great question because not to mention security ministers are focused on on threats, preventing crime and violence at home. Uh, many security ministers have also been doing double duty during the pandemic and uh, and addressing the spread of of COVID and other um, kind of the, the related after effects. So. Um, so very much agree that uh, that security ministers are in a difficult position with competing interests right now. I, I do think the, um, perhaps I'm a little bit biased, but I, I think that the benefits are a little bit self-evident that um, uh, that we too have uh, have information from our uh, from our many partnerships that we can pass back, and and all of our information uh, sharing programs are are designed to do that. The the targeting rules through the through the national targeting center, um, to the extent that we can apply those for our for our partners, it it also prevents a um, uh, risk from from entering their borders. So I, I think that's very much uh, part of the value proposition that that we make. Yeah, no, and that's that's a very important point, um, uh, Kirsten. If I can ask you, one of our uh, questioners asks about the uh, uh, Sawab Center uh, in Abu Dhabi that was launched in 2015 uh, uh, and spearheaded by the U.S. government um, uh, to try to contest ISIS's use of social media. Uh, you worked at the Global Engagement Center, uh, uh, and I think have an important perspective. Uh, in terms of, of that kind of, of cooperation. Uh, and then Assistant Secretary Boyd, I'll ask if DHS is, is also involved in some of those efforts to counter uh, terrorist use of social media and the internet. But uh, Kirsten, what's your perspective on, on uh, uh, the value and importance of trying to uh, engage uh, through foreign partners on efforts to deal with uh, internet and, and other uh, online radicalization in their countries? I think working with the partners on this is, is critical. Without commenting on whether the Swab Center's efforts specifically have been you know, impactful in any way or the GECs, but the point being that the US can't do this alone and should not. The US is not the best messenger for many of these counter narrative um, uh, programs. And it's been kind of a bipartisan uh, agreement that really this role by partner nations is best served with the US as an enabler and, and as a, a coordinating, a facilitating, you know, function giver, but not really as the person doing the countering ourselves because we simply don't understand the truth on the ground or the motivations of those that these messages need to reach the way that our partners will since many of them are their own citizens or people coming into their countries. So the, the partnership there is, is, is absolutely critical. Also in terms of the volume of this kind of messaging, you can't have one country or one office trying to do this by themselves. We just can't be everywhere at one place online. So, have, so sharing that effort and dividing that labor with our partners in a coordinated way is incredibly helpful. And Assistant Secretary Boyd, what role does DHS play in terms of countering uh, online radicalization uh, and other kinds of terrorist use of the internet? Uh, what, is, what is DHS's uh, level of activity in this space? So I really agree with with Kristen's point that that it is a broad based coalition effort and um, DHS works closely, for example, with the GIFT CT, the Global Internet Forum to uh, to counter terrorism, which is a, a consortium dedicated to fighting terrorist content on the on the web. And this involves the technology sector and a, and a wide variety of, of partners. Um, the other thing that, that I should mention that DHS does is um, our new office of, of targeted violence and terrorism prevention is taking the lead on helping um, public and private stakeholders get ahead of the danger um, by promoting education and community awareness, counter recruitment activities, early warning programs and intervention efforts. Uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, and, and certainly um, this is an office that uh, uh, is, is relatively new and has a great deal of importance. Uh, and a great deal of interest uh, in the mission space uh, dealing with online radicalization, uh, as well as things that go on in local communities here in the United States. Um, I wanna thank everyone. I think we'll wrap up this section of the discussion uh, uh, and set the stage for our next panel in just a minute. I do wanna thank Assistant Secretary Boyd for uh, her remarks and, and her engaging with us. Uh, also to Ambassador Winstanley, uh, to Javed Kirsten, 
uh, Dan, uh, uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, let me turn the program now over to Kirsten, who will moderate the final panel, uh, uh, because uh, it's been useful to have uh, the US perspective, but it's also very important to have the Gulf perspective uh, uh, of the people uh, uh, who are the, the other part of the security partnerships we're talking about trying to build and to facilitate. Uh, and as Valerie said, uh, uh, in ways that benefit the security both of the United States and of uh, the countries uh, uh, in the region. So if I can introduce uh, Kirsten to please uh, uh, take this from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. And to your point, let's get some regional perspectives here on some of these same questions about the value of this cooperation to the region and to the US, and then also some perspectives on what the region thinks uh, are the greatest challenges facing these kinds of civilian law enforcement uh, entities in their own countries and what that poses in terms of challenges for US cooperation with their organizations. So we have two panelists joining us for a quick conversation. We'll be here for about 30 minutes and you are welcome to send in some questions. Uh, our, two, our first panelist is Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Dana Homeid El Marzuki. She's General Director of the International Affairs Bureau at the UAE Ministry of Interior. She began her career with the MOI, directing the division focused on combating child explo exploitation and later moved to oversee the ministry's organizational and project management operations. At the International Cooperation Directorate now, she oversees all of the MOI's international activities, including UAE's police attache offices abroad, as well as the development and management of the ministry's MOUs and cooperation agreements with partner nations. We're also welcoming Dr. Abdullah bin Khaled Al Saud. He is an assistant professor in the College of Strategic Sciences at Naif Arab University for Security Sciences in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He's affiliated with the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence at King's College London. Dr. Abdullah Al Saud's research interests include radicalization, terrorism, political violence, the ideology of political Islamist groups, and security studies focusing on the GCC. So let's begin by talking about the threats that drive the need for counterterrorism cooperation and international counterterrorism coordination to begin with. Can, can you both tell me, Dr. Donna and Dr. Abdullah, what is your view of the threat from Al-Qaeda and ISIS's style of terrorism in the region? Dr. Donna, if we could begin with you. I think that uh, counter to a lot of um, uh, to an argument, an ongoing argument, that the threat from Al Qaeda and ISIS is lulling down and uh, it's going through a slow slope. I think um, their style of terrorism poses a huge threat to the region because they have been uh, improving their way of expanding their activities. I think one of the challenges that we are facing that we keep looking at them as two terrorist organizations which is the outcome of the actual problem, which is the ideologies. I think we need to change the way we deal with them uh, and mirror the changes happening in terrorism all, all, overall. Um, Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS have improved their way of recruitment. They have used uh, social media and online platform to recruit their followers. They've used it for their propaganda. We are still dealing with their threat in the traditional way. And I think it's very critical. And the argument that I've heard from fellow colleagues uh, today, it's very critical to not only rely on military action. It's very important that we are uh, incorporating civilian counterterrorism um, uh, organizations like in the law enforcement, border security and aviation security. It's very critical to engage them in the conversation. The point of view is different from the military uh, point of view. The access to information also is different. ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda in the region are using a lot of means to fund terrorism. So law enforcement, for example, and border security are able to provide the, the, the point of view from a criminal standpoint. So they have that access to information about money laundering. They have this access about information to funding terrorism. They have this access to information about moving money and moving people across borders. So um, there is much need more than ever to engage those civil societies uh, in, in facing the threat that is posed by Al-Qaeda and uh, by ISIS. Fantastic kickoff. Dr. Abdullah, can you offer your thoughts on, on what the threat looks like now from Al-Qaeda and ISIS? Uh, thank you, Kristen. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking about this very important topic. Uh, I think there have been uh, notable successes in, in recent years in fighting 
uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, you know, ISIS have lost all of its territory. Uh, their leader have been uh, targeted and killed. But it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, wrong to assume that the threat uh, is, is any less now than, than before. The report itself have, has mentioned that they're at an activity level uh, similar to that in 2012, before the rise of the so-called caliphate. And, uh, you know, the, these, it's, it, these terrorist groups are certainly not static. They evolve, they adapt, they innovate in response to changing circumstances. Uh, you know, the, in, in recent decades, they have uh, adopted the decentralized structure in order to empower affiliates. So there's like a franchise model. Uh, when we look at the radicalization process itself, it has become uh, less intimate and, and more immediate and, and quicker than before, uh, facilitated in large part by the advances in social media and communication in ways that were never possible before. And even the technological advances have been exploited and utilized by these groups. Uh, if we look to, for, for instance, uh, their use of drones, uh, the digital currencies. Uh, so all of these things point to the fact that the danger is still there. And if you look at the experience of Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, in 2003, there was uh, the, uh, uh, a campaign, a violent campaign by Al-Qaeda uh, for two years. And the Saudi uh, hard power and, and uh, security, uh, the, the law enforcement and security uh, officials have been successful in driving the threat uh, outside the border of Saudi Arabia. But where did they go? They went to Yemen, a weak and fragile state. So that's the problem we have in, in, in the region. We have lots of open and festering wounds that will keep attract all of these radical elements, uh, providing safe havens from which they can plan, thrive, recruit. And also it's a continuous rallying cries to pr providing those terrorists with continuous rallying cries to keep attracting new followers. So uh, that is the, 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 the most, I would say, uh, pressing uh, issue that we have. When it comes to counterterrorism, uh, unfortunately, most countries are faced with two main trade-offs uh, in, this, in this regard. The first is between focusing on counterterrorism concerns and other uh, foreign policy objectives. So after 9-11, I, I, I think it's fair to argue that the Bush administration focused or, or placed priority on counterterrorism. After that, if we look, if we look at the region uh, specifically, if we take the JCPOA uh, as, as, uh, as an example, I think it shows that uh, you know counterterrorism has been looked at separately, in isolation from other uh, foreign policy objectives. And I think the best way going forward is to have an integrated approach, where counterterrorism and other foreign policy objectives uh, are part and parcel of of one uh, integrated approach. Another trade-off is between short-term and long-term goals. You know, the military hard power is is. Uh, is going to secure the short-term goals, and it's very appealing. It's sexy; everyone wants it. But the the civilian and non-military counterterrorism measures need longer time and deeper commitment, and they are the ones that will produce tangible and long-lasting results uh, down the line. Because, you know, ultimately, uh, I agree with the authors of the report that you need to uh, think of the desired end game, and uh, to do that you need to empower countries to deal with the terrorist uh, threat at the local level and to transition from military work to police or law, law enforcement work. But to do that, countries need to have capable and efficient police force, uh, prosecutorial capacity, capable judiciary and legal infrastructure, functioning prison systems. And that's very difficult to achieve and will need definitely deeper uh, counterterrorism uh, cooperation between countries. Fantastic. There's so many threads to pull on here. Let's let's finish the framing really, really briefly. So what I'm hearing from you all is that the threat from Al Qaeda and ISIS is really the model of decentralization that is based on ideology that functions through things like social media and digital currency, kind of this new shift in in how they operate. And then, you know, we're also looking at destabilizing factors in the region from uh, state actors. Uh, can you talk a bit about what you think in terms of Iran? Um, you touched on this, Dr. Abdallah, proxy activities, things like cyber asymmetrics. Um, 
can the two sets of threats be dealt with with the same toolkit or is it necessary to have separate international cooperation efforts, um, separate organizations within governments? How do you think it's best to address these two very different profiles of potential uh, threat? Dr. Bella, would you would you please start since I'm really drawing? On yes, uh, definitely the same tool tool set uh, can can be utilized to deal with the same uh, uh, threats or, or both of the, both of the threats. Um, you know, the, Iran uh, empowers uh, terrorist proxies in the region. Uh, IRGC involved in transporting uh, foreign fighters uh, to many. Uh, areas around the region. So, you know, co cooperation in aviation control and border control can be beneficial, sharing information in that regard. Uh, cybersecurity also is, is very important to, to share information and, and have deeper cooperation in it. But I would say, you know, one of the uh, great recommendations uh, in this report is, and this has been touched upon uh, in the last, in the, in the previous panel, it's very important to have uh, uh, multilateral efforts and regional ones, but it's also equally important to have bilateral ones and to, be, to appreciate the differences in threat perception and constraint between the countries in the region. Uh, that would result, I think, in deeper cooperation. And I think an integrated approach where, depending on the kind of counterterrorism cooperation, uh, one uses uh, multilateral or bilateral approach uh, can be beneficial. But there are, you know, plenty of examples, successful examples of successful cooperation, uh, multilaterally and bilaterally. Uh, some of them mentioned previously the terrorist financing targeting center, uh, co-chaired by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, and uh, you know, comprises all six uh, GCC states with the United States. Uh, you know, there is just last week the uh, strategic uh, U.S.-Saudi strategic dialogue was launched. Uh, and it could be uh, a great venue to enhance civilian counterterrorism efforts between the two countries and perhaps even overcome some of the alignment differences with regards to the security architectures. Uh, regionally, there is the GCC US Strategic Cooperation Forum launched, launched in 2012. And in 2013, the meeting saw the formation of the joint US GCC Security Committee to address issues related to counterterrorism and border security. So there are lots of forums and venues to deepen cooperation. Another, another uh, venue, the International Military Counterterrorism Coalition, of which the United States is a supporting member. And even though uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, the, the name is military, it also engages in capacity building and it comprises more than 40 uh, member states, Muslim member states. And you know a number of them from Africa or even Asia are, are at a relative disadvantage when it comes to technological infrastructure or resources needed to bolster civilian counterterrorism capacity. So cooperation in that regard can be uh, can yield very beneficial rewards. Wonderful. And Dr. Dana, can you offer your thoughts on what might be the best ways to structure international cooperation to tackle the dual nature of the threats, both state-sponsored and non-state actors? I think it's important to start with the question of what are we trying to achieve? Um, as a practitioner, I'm gonna talk from a practitioner point of view. Um, it's very critical for us to utilize all the channels we have at our disposal. As uh, Dr. Abdullah said, there is a lot of forums and there's a lot of uh, venues to have this conversation and this discussion, but it's very cr uh, critical for us to align our priorities. Uh, often we see that priorities are different when it comes to combating those issues in the region. It's very critical to understand the priorities of the state countries. It's very in, uh, important to understand the capabilities and the uh, political and economic agenda of the of, 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 uh, of countries in the region uh, in order for us to be able to build a, a capability uh, that is uh, aligned with this vision. Um, I have found from my experience working um, uh, through uh, multiple channels, diplomatic channels and non-diplomatic channels, that often channels um, um, that happen in informal setting um, uh, um, uh, between law enforcement agencies, such as working groups or a task force uh, with a specific objective and a specific um, uh, and a specific outcome in mind, I find them more beneficial and more effective 
Europe than other forums where the discussion is uh, always stuck at policy level and strategic level. So I, I really encourage those forums where there is a clear, uh, clear target and clear objectives and clear initiatives and clear projects. Today, actually, in fact, uh, the United Arab Emirates signed with the United States just a couple of hours ago the Strategic Dialogue Memorandum of Understanding. And amongst um, a lot of those subcommittees uh, are subcommittees dedicated to fighting terrorism in the region, but also subcommittees uh, d uh, dedicated to empowering civil uh, society agencies such as law enforcement and border control agencies to have a conversation amongst them, to come up with solutions, to come up with projects, to come up with bilateral uh, agreements that are more technical, that are more on the ground, in order for us to be able to achieve uh, to achieve tangible results. Wonderful, thank you. Um, a quick question about you know some of the things we're dealing with today, in in terms of the of COVID nineteen, um, as the world copes with this with this security threat from COVID nineteen in terms of public health, economic issues. Uh, how do you think terrorist groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda specifically are seeking to exploit these disruptions? Um, and how are law enforcement agencies and governments more broadly in the region responding to these threats? Dr. Abdullah, I'll, I'll let you start, but, but Dr. Donna, in your response, could you briefly describe the UAE's counterterrorism efforts and the role of the Ministry of Interior, your Bureau of International Affairs in particular, and how the different Emirates and different parts of the Emirati government coordinate on counterterrorism issues using COVID-19 is kind of a case study here to, to walk us through a bit of that. So Dr. Abdullah, back to you. Uh, how do you believe these organizations are exploiting COVID-19 in their, in their attempts to disrupt uh, nations in the Gulf? Yeah, I think COVID-19 has placed limitations on terrorist groups just like everyone else in terms of movement, but they have certainly try to exploit uh, what happened and integrate it within, within their narrative uh, that are already uh, in existence. So for, for instance, both ISIS and Al-Qaeda have, uh, have you know, tried to, to convince their followers that COVID-19 is, is a punishment from God to uh, you know, the, the uh, crusaders and the non-believers and as you know, they even uh, they, they, uh, uh, when it comes to Muslim countries uh, like you know the Gulf and other other Muslim nations, they treat them as uh, murtadin or or apostates. So they don't uh, they they're not within the the uh, uh, Islamic uh, you know people. So. Uh, in that regard, they they have tried to convince them. But the difference between them, uh, ISIS has tried to convince followers to take this opportunity to commit more attacks. Uh, they have uh, tried to argue that COVID-19 is going to cause uh, other countries to lessen the pressure on them uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in other countries, in Africa. So there is an opportunity now to uh, you know, go on and with their attacks and even free uh, their prisoners uh, and, uh, you know, make the, the uh, hurt from, from this crisis even more so. Uh, Al-Qaeda tried to appeal to the hearts and minds of, of, of people, asking them to, you know, reflect on this, uh, on this pandemic as, because it's a punishment from God, so reflect look within and try to repent if you're if you're Muslims uh, if you're uh, when they're talking to the United States they say well look what what your leadership and your governments have done so they really try to exploit this uh, in their narrative and uh, knowing fully well that many people around the world are, are spending so much time uh, in their homes and online, so they really uh, up their game uh, in terms of, of uh, you know online presence. Uh, so the, the, you can see that very clearly if you follow their uh, their messages and their, their forums. Thank you, and and Dr. Donna, can you speak a bit to how the UAE is addressing uh, you know the exploitation of COVID nineteen by uh, extremist groups or other threat groups? Um, yes, of course. I just want to add something to what Dr. Abdullah said. Uh, we found as well that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, especially in the region, have exploited as well the security situation in some of the countries. Law enforcement and, and, and most of the government is focused on the frontliners 
combating um, and fighting COVID-19. So there have been a lot of um, um, uh, pushback from those groups on a community level and society level, um, uh, trying to um, uh, to uh, to um, 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 uh, spark uh, disagreement and uh, and and anger towards job losses and towards uh, some of the impacts that happened in the region. And that, of course, is causing unrest in some of the countries, not in GCT countries, but some of the uh, Arab countries on our end. We have conducted a lot of operations. So during COVID-19, we found that those uh, terrorist groups and uh, other uh, other hostile uh, players in the region uh, that are either funding terrorism or uh, or uh, or supporting it uh, poli- um, uh, politically, we found that um, they have been very active uh, on a criminal level. Uh, they have engaged in uh, cryptocurrencies um, um, uh, situations where uh, they, there is uh, counterfeit supplies. We have uh, seen a surge in online uh, exploitation. A sexual exploitation of children. We have seen a surge in the numbers of online recruitment of uh, individuals, especially youngsters between the ages of 17 and 24, uh, to join those uh, groups. We have seen a lot of attempts to recruit lone wolves uh, online. So what we have been doing is focusing on multiple areas. First area, we've been focusing on cybersecurity. I think this is a very critical area. The fight have moved from the streets to online. So that's an area that's very critical for us to invest in and to work in and build capability in. We've worked with our with our counterparts, our uh, colleagues uh, in the States and in uh, Europe and uh, in uh, Asia on a lot of uh, operations that happened online. In addition to online, we have uh, been focusing on uh, money laundering and uh, funding terrorism. Uh, in this uh, in this um, in this uh, period, we're trying to tighten the loops. Uh, and make it difficult and impossible for money to move and uh, for individual to move cross borders. Um, the third thing that we've been working on very closely is uh, we're working through working groups, whether that was through the Interpol or the Europol or informal working groups that we have formed during the pandemic when working on transnational crime and extremist activities, uh, specifically in some countries like Europe. Um, um, and the recent uh, the recent events that happened in France is a, is, a, is a great example that what we are facing with those terrorist groups is the ideology, not just that terrorist activities and the actual violence, uh, violence outcome and violence extremism. Uh, <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you. I, I, I want to dive a bit into comments you both made about uh, how Al-Qaeda and ISIS are exploiting grievances, things like job loss due to COVID um, and how we're seeing surges, as you mentioned, Dr. Donna, in exploitation of children and recruitment of youth. Um, Because a lot of those topics are often addressed by civil society programs, do you all see, this is a a question we have um, from the viewing audience, do you all see a role for civil society or NGOs, local actors, um, non-governmental actors in facilitating the multilateral cooperation on on addressing those problem sets specific to the the ground level recruitment uh, or some of these problems that you mentioned, Dr. Donna? I think it's so critical to work with NGOs. Our work would not be completed without uh, engaging civil society, the access they have to the community, first of all. Second of all, the insights that they have into some community and, and, and some efforts they can do on the ground that government agencies cannot do on the ground. It's very critical and it's very important to align ourselves with them. We've been working with NGOs in the UAE and in the States and in Europe and in Asia and engaging them in activities that we've been working on, especially things that has to do with interfaith dialogue and things that has to do uh, that have to do with community. Uh, something that I need to add, um, I think it's very critical to involve and engage the private sector. Uh, we found that conversations with technology providers such as Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Twitter are very important and very critical. Their platforms are being used and exploited by those groups. And it's very important for us to come to an understanding what is considered freedom of speech and freedom of uh, and right of uh, use of those uh, platforms and what's considered uh, danger to community and to society. We found that recruitment that's happening online is increasing uh, tremendously. 
And when we have those conversations with those technology companies, they're very open to having this conversation. They just need uh, more um, collaboration from uh, law enforcement. Um, the way law enforcement deal with the technology companies usually and traditionally is uh, directing specific cases on them, specific questions, uh, asking for specific details on specific accounts. And I think this way might have worked 10 years ago, but we cannot work like this anymore. We need to come together to come up with technological solutions using artificial intelligence, um, using um, uh, precautionary um, uh, um, uh, steps, uh, coming up with initiatives where we can actually engage with technology companies and civil society in tracing the trends online and coming up with significant root cause solutions. Great, and Dr. Abdullah, your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think this is an important issue. Definitely working with civil society institutions, and uh, but I would say this is even more important in areas outside the Gulf, uh, in areas where actually uh, you know some of the terrorist groups govern or sem semi-govern, because we have seen similarity here between them and, for instance, some organized criminal networks in other countries where they have tried to use this uh, situation, this pandemic. Uh, to entrench themselves within the society that uh, they, they, they operate, uh, providing medical help, providing, uh, uh, you know, uh, instructions, uh, even closing down public place spaces. So, uh, you know, cooperation in that regard is, is, is necessary because at the end of the day, you know, the terrorist threat is, is transnational. Uh, one cannot in this world, globalized and interdependent world, close the border and say we're we're safe. Uh, you're not because you know you have all of these festering wounds around you, and unless that is dealt with uh, collectively by an international effort, you're gonna remain in danger. Excellent points. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to 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 jump to a, qu a question that will pull from you. Hopefully, some recommendations from your end. Um, in terms of next steps for regional CT cooperation in and amongst the region and with the US, what are some potential areas where international cooperation on counterterrorism could be improved? And as a follow up to your thoughts on that question, Dr. Donna, is the UAE interested in partnering with the US perhaps to help other countries improve their capabilities in areas such as aviation security and border security? Um, any, any thoughts there to lead that off? And then Dr. Abdullah, do you see the Saudi OPM MOI program through which U.S. law enforcement agencies partner with and train Saudi civilian security services as a model that the rest of the region could or should replicate um, as it is or with modifications? Dr. Donna, can we begin with you? Um, I think today's signature of the strategic dialogue uh, memorandum of understanding between the United States and the United Arab Emirates is a testament of how aligned we are on a lot of areas. And I think one of the areas is capability building in countries uh, in need for that. And I think it's uh, within the spirit of what's happening around the world, it's only right that we extend the hands of support and, uh, and uh, uh, exchange information and exchange experiences with other countries. We have worked with the United United States on multiple projects. Uh, um, um, uh, this uh, strategic dialogue uh, is just another forum, but we have worked with them on uh, multiple projects. We have done joint operations, and those joint operations, for example, we've worked with the United States very closely on uh, the virtual global task force, and we've conducted joint operation on specific uh, crimes like sexual exploitation of children. We also worked with the United States and multiple countries on specific situations like money laundering and funding of terrorism. So is there an appetite to do that? Yes, of course. Do we want to do it? And are we able to do it? Yes, of course. We have gained a lot of experience in the previous uh, seven to uh, 10 years uh, on uh, multiple issues and uh, the capability building, a moderate modernization and um, um, uh, the improvement in technologies and artificial intelligence is uh, will help us to be an active partner with the United States uh, in this regard. Wonderful. And and Dr. Abdella? Yeah, I, th I think definitely it sounds like a great model, the OPM, uh, in the MOI. Uh, I'm not in government, so I can't really uh, comment with deeper knowledge on it, but it sounds like a great model that can be replicated 
I would just point out that, you know, cooperation in these international cooperations uh, and even bilateral cooperation on, on the non-military counterterrorism is difficult for many reasons. Uh, so many of them have been highlighted in the report, in the great report, I might add. Uh, but it's generally easier for a country to deploy milit military training than to train, say, for example, judges or prosecutors. Uh, because the training required for policing and other law enforcement is difficult than, say, you know, training someone how to shoot. Uh, and the type of assistance that also most nations want and ask for is in the military. Also, you know, there are so many different legal and value systems between countries that can complicate things uh, in this regard. But I would say, you know, even, uh, you know, um, academic, institutions, security institutions can be utilized uh, in this regard. Uh, you know, I don't want to market my university, but the uh, Naifa Arab University is, the, is uniquely positioned because it's the scientific arm of the Council, uh, Arab Council of Interior Ministers. And it can be a vehicle, vehicle through which, uh, you know, bespoke training programs can be provided not only to law enforcement uh, staff in the GCC, but throughout the whole Arab world. Uh, and similar initiatives can be pursued. And I sincerely hope that, you know, many of the great recommendations in this report find the receptive audience. Wonderful. I'd like to turn to one or two questions remaining from the audience um, in the time we have left. And one of them, we, we know it's a truth that in, in regions across the world, often uh, some of the recruitment into extremist organizations is fueled by complaints among populations of abuses at the hands of local law enforcement agencies. That's got to be a, you know, difficult for people in policy positions and security services to deal with, how to then get down to the ground level with each and every officer who's in a tough position in sometimes hostile, hostile environments. What do you think multilateral cooperation can do in terms of working with neighbors, in terms of working with the U.S. or other partners to, to help reduce the degree to which abuses by law enforcement worldwide uh, can be reduced as a driver to radicalization of local populations? What are we not doing that we should be doing to assist with all of our partner countries where this is a, where this is a problem? Dr. Dana, if you have thoughts first, please. To start with, um, countries um, rectify a lot of United Nations uh, laws and manifestos on uh, on uh, things like this. So, from a policy level, on a, on a, on, a, on an international level, and from a policy level on domestic level, um, this issue has been addressed in law and regulation. I think what we need to be doing is focusing on training officers. I think um, we need to think about officers in different capacities. There are officers that are in uh, corrective facilities. There are officers that are on the ground, that they do patrolling, that they are interacting with the communities. There are officers that more around investigating behind desks, behind offices. Training one size doesn't fit all. I think we need to understand this. And I think when we work together, we need to design programs because right now there's a lot of capability building happening. I kid you not, there is multiple programs this year only with COVID-19 happening. Uh, on my desk, I received more than 20 something uh, uh, training uh, programs for officers. Uh, but what I see the trend in all of them, it's the one size fit all. It's one training for one type of officer. You need to understand that officers interacting with community need a different type of training than officers who are working in corrective facilities and in prisons. They are, it's a different training that with, with officers that are investigating radicalization, crime, and, 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 and uh, terrorism. So I think what we need to do working together, um, as, whether by literally or whether uh, multi-agency um, work, we need to really look at the capability building of officers, number one. Number two, when we talk about policy and we talk about regulations, those things are filled. There is, there is everything that would cover um, uh, um, um, these issues. The problem and the issue is an implementation. And I think implementation comes with awareness. There's a lot of uh, police officers that don't know what are their rights and what are the rights of others. So a lot of awareness has to happen on policy and um, regulation. So two things, awareness on policy and regulation, that's very critical for police force. Two, we need to design training to, to officers um, who are different in their capacities from each other. 
Wonderful. I love practical, actionable recommendations. You're speaking directly to my heart. <laughs> and Dr. Abdullah, any thoughts here? I think I, I agree with everything uh, you know, Dr. Dana uh, mentioned. I would only add <clears throat> that there, there needs to be also accountability through laws and regulations if disproportionate force is used, for instance. Uh, but also, also, I would like to caution that you know the radicalization process is very complex, and it cannot be boiled down to a single uh, factor. Uh, it's it's always tempting to to try to. Uh, make sense of something this complex, but there are so many uh, routes that uh, each individual radical that ends up joining a terrorist group takes that you cannot really boil it down to a single uh, single fact. That makes a lot of sense. Um, for our final question, I'd like to pose to you both a question that was posed to the U.S. panelists prior, and that is, in your views, what is the value to your countries and to the U.S. of civilian non-military international counterterrorism cooperation between the U.S. and Arab Gulf countries? And Dr. Donna, feel free to speak specifically to the Emirati experience. Dr. Abdullah, you're welcome to speak to the Saudi experience or in terms of your research to the Gulf writ large. Dr. Donna, can we please begin with you? I'd love to speak about the Emirati experience working with uh, the United States, specifically in law enforcement, and specifically I'm going to talk about the International Affairs Bureau. We had a meeting today with our counterparts, the police attaches, the FBI representative, the Department of Justice uh, individuals. They were all in the office today. And we were all sitting together working on a specific investigation. And I think that is absolutely incredible because there is so much value in conversation and dialogue. There is so much value in that. We can design memorandums of understanding all we want, and we can work on treaties and agreements between countries and bilateral rules and responsibilities. And all of this is very great as a diplomatic track. I welcome that. It's very critical and it's very important. And this is the official and formal vehicle to collaboration. But there is nothing like deep and dirty work. There is nothing like working with your counterpart, opening your files in front of them, sharing information, being transparent with your objectives and your agenda, being honest about what you are trying to achieve, extending the same hand of support as the hand you are receiving from the other end, being equal in your desire to make the relationship work. And I can testify that we have had only success working with our counterparts in the United States with them, with them, with the distance between us. Um, that has never been a problem. We have police attaches. I have a police attache in Washington and another one in New York, and they have police attaches here. And we rely on them and we rely on the diplomatic channel. But believe me um, when I say there is nothing like working on specific cases and solving specific problems, being honest with each other about what are we trying to achieve and actually going to achieve it together. You will really, most of the time, 100% of the time, you'll find that the objectives are aligned. We all want the safety and security of our citizens. We all want the safety and security of our communities and of the communities of the world. So it's only natural for us to work together from experience I can see only good things happening in the future. Wonderful empirical data supporting the argument for more international cooperation. And uh, Dr. Abdullah, would you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree. I think there are plenty of, of uh, benefits and rewards to be gained from uh, deeper cooperation uh, in, in civilian counterterrorism. Uh, you know, the report mentioned one incident in two, 2010. Uh, where uh, a tip from Saudi Arabia foiled, uh, you know, a bomb plot, the printed cartilage bomb plot. And that shows just one aspect of the benefits of such deeper cooperation. And I think, you know, it's beneficial for both sides for, from, from a Saudi point of view, from the whole Gulf point of view, and from the point of view of the United States, you know, uh, as you mentioned, Kristen, earlier, you know, in the counter-narrative uh, field, it is, uh, you know, some benefits, the United States can benefit from the experiences uh, and, and the know-how uh, in, in, this, in this region. Also in the uh, rehabilitation and de-radicalization, or I might say disengagement from violence, because, you know, Saudi Arabia has a long uh, history in this regard uh, that can be beneficial. And I'm, I'm sure there are, there are deeper cooperations. You know, it's often said when you want to fight terrorism, you go after uh, men, money, and mindset. Only the first aspect of this can be done through military hard power. Uh, and the rest, 
can only be achieved through uh, non-military civilian concertism, and that shows you the importance of deeper cooperation in that. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for sharing your experience from the region and your wisdom based on your uh, your personal experience researching and working with American counterparts and the arguments you've made for continuing international and multilateral cooperation on counterterrorism, even as the counterterrorist landscape shifts. So I'll turn it back over to Tom right now with many, many thanks to Dr. Donna and to Dr. Abdullah for sharing your insights and wisdom. Thank you, Krista. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kirsten, and, and thank you also uh, to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dana and uh, Dr. Abdallah uh, for some enormously uh, useful and valuable insights. Um, uh, in wrapping this up, uh, uh, I do want to say that our report is available online. There's a wealth of detail on the points that we've developed here and on a number of, of other things that we didn't have time to discuss here. Uh, we'll have the link in the uh, in the chat window if you want to take a look at that. Um, I, I do want to take moderator's prerogative and, and uh, draw on one point that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dana came up with on uh, during her remarks that actually uh, uh, is like the U.S. Embassy capacity problem. One of those hugely important points that may sound technical, but is actually enormously leveraging, far more than many people outside of this area uh, 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 understand. Uh, and that was the point that um, uh, uh, Colonel Dana made uh, about the limitations uh, on how law enforcement engages with the tech sector and social media. Um, I completely agree with uh, uh, and, and endorse the remarks that Colonel Dana made that our traditional approaches to how this is done uh, are no longer adequate for the situation that we face. We discussed this on pages 53 through 55 of the report because there actually have been some important recent changes to US law uh, that I think many of us feel were a necessary first step, but is by no means the last step uh, in how this is done. This is the kind of thing that here in the United States is going to take uh, some extensive and detailed conversations um, that include both American security agencies, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and others. Uh, uh, it will necessarily involve the U.S. Congress. It needs to involve the social media companies themselves and the American public. Uh, clearly, this is an area that uh, uh, is, is essential that there be change, uh, as, as uh, Colonel Dana uh, has mentioned, this is not something unique to the United States or to the United Arab Emirates, but in fact uh, is an issue that I think almost every country uh, that's beset by the challenge of terrorist use of social media uh, needs to come to uh, uh, to understand uh, uh, and and to solve uh, and to go to the point that Kirsten and others were were making. I think it would be beneficial if these discussions were as multilateral as possible, uh, uh, because even countries such as Europe, which have a, a different perspective on privacy that the United States, or as the Arab countries do, uh, uh, need to be included in the discussion. But it is vital, I think, uh, uh, to the challenge uh, uh, that uh, uh, Colonel Dana has pointed to, how do we protect our societies uh, and gain the benefits of, uh, uh, of the technology that many of us are relying on even today in this Zoom conference. Uh, let me take just a moment to say uh, where the Atlantic Council will go, for here, uh, go from here uh, with this report. Um, uh, we obviously uh, are very grateful for your participation and interest in uh, this session today. Uh, we'll be continuing to talk about this uh, issue on other panels and other discussions in other areas. Uh, uh, and we welcome the opportunity to, uh, uh, to address this issue in different contexts. Uh, uh, obviously, here in the United States, uh, we have an election two weeks from today. Um, uh, we're supposed to say all Americans need a plan to vote. Uh, uh, please, I hope you have one. But regardless of the outcome of the election, uh, the issues that we discuss today are very important, and they're going to be, need to be folded into discussions. Uh, discussions about the future direction of counterterrorism, discussion, discussions about the future directions of international cooperation, of, of choices uh, that all governments will be making, how they choose to work with each other uh, bilaterally and multilaterally, and how they address uh, threats to, to 
uh, a, a civil society uh, anywhere in the world, regardless of country or culture. Um, I believe that we are poised for major change in this area. Uh, I think one of the lessons that many people have taken away from the events of the last few years is that military power is important and it has a, a role to play, especially at certain times. But we're moving into a world where, at least we hope, military power is not the sufficient or final answer. Uh, and this then causes us to think of what other tools uh, and approaches are there and are they better suited to meet the challenges and threats of today. Uh, I think there's considerable value in uh, rethinking uh, the approach of, of civilian uh, uh, cooperation outside of the military and intelligence realms, because we really are poised uh, at a chance for, for using those tools uh, in preference to tools uh, where we recognize the expense and risk that they necessarily entail. Uh, where there are countries that are interested in working together, uh, it's in the interests of, of other countries to be receptive and supportive where it's possible to do so uh, in an effort to try to, to strengthen uh, uh, the mutual security. Uh, uh, and that, I think, is, is one of the major lessons that I at least uh, took away from the, the project. Uh, and we're very grateful for uh, uh, the ability to do this. I wanted to say a special thanks to Josie Palayo, my co-author, who's helped us very much uh, uh, with the research uh, on this, and to Shiva Tabatabai Nijad, uh, who worked with us at the Atlantic Council previously and also played an important role in putting together uh, a lot of the work that you see here today. Uh, let me thank our keynote speaker, Assistant Secretary uh, Valerie Boyd from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a, a pleasure to hear you and, and uh, to have the opportunity to gain the benefit of your insights in the work that uh, uh, DHS is doing. Those of us who are alumni uh, uh, of the Department of Homeland Security uh, are familiar with it, but it's not as well known or understood. Uh, and in many ways, as we say in the report, misnomer because DHS is the third largest overseas presence of any civilian department of the U.S. government. Um, uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Dana Humayd al-Marzuki, who's Assistant Secretary Boyd's uh, 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 counterpart in the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Interior. Thank you very much for joining us from your home. We especially appreciate uh, the fact that uh, you are eight hours ahead of us and you're at the end of the day where uh, the rest of us are still in the middle of ours. So thank you very much for that. And as well, uh, Dr. Abdullah bin Khalid al-Saud uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, given the lateness of the hour there. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, my U.S. panel participants, uh, uh, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Win Stanley, uh, uh, Javad Ali, Danny Glazer, uh, uh, Kirsten Fontenrose, and Will Wexler for hosting us and for leading the uh, uh, enterprise here at the Atlantic Council that has put this uh, together. Thank you again very much for your time and, and interest today and for your questions. Uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion on our social media platforms uh, uh, through the Atlantic Council on, on Twitter, Facebook, uh, and other sources. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, uh, we wish you a, a safe, a prosperous, uh, and secure uh, future. Please enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you very much on behalf of the Atlantic Council for your interest in today's program.